The next talk is by Russ George, and he'll be talking about uh, his measurements of helium-3 and helium-4. Anyway, uh, one of the one of the characteristics of cold fusion scientists seems to be that they're mostly monogamous type people to their experiments. If they do one typical experiment, I'm, I'm a polygamist experimentalist in this field, so I've been doing lots of uh, of different work. And, and for the last few, for a number of years since about 1993, I've been putting considerable effort into looking at helium as the nuclear product in different experiments. And uh, I originally started looking at this stuff. I did some of the electrochemical experiments, and they were so difficult to do, I uh, found that very frustrating. And then I got involved with Roger Stringham in the fairly early days when he was working on the cavitation, ultrasound-induced cavitation. And I worked for a number of years on that. And, I, and I'm still running that. Uh, cavitation type work. And then more recently, uh, in uh, I guess a year and a half ago or so, I worked with Arata, had the opportunity to go to Japan and work with Arata and Zhang in their laboratory for, uh, for many weeks. And then last year, I, uh, having been at the uh, Vancouver conference where Les Case talked about his catalyst experiments, having been working with Arata, who is uh, the particles in his, the powder, the palladium powder he had was, is very extraordinary. It's not palladium black, as, as is sort of commonly reported. It's really palladium nanoparticles, which is very much finer than palladium. Palladium black is, if you buy it from a commercial source, is never smaller than about 300 nanometers, 200 to 300 nanometers. May I ask you a question? Does sure. anybody know where he got that from? Yes. Is it public in the public domain? No, but I'll tell you something. <laughs> <laughs> it was made in the U.S. It was. Yeah, and it, and it was sold by a Canadian, uh, an American supply, a uh, Japanese supplier. It was sold by a U.S. firm to a Japanese supplier who passed it on to Arata. And it is, and and the unique thing about Arata's materials, Arata actually has only spoken about a fraction of his studies over the years. He's he's he uh, leaks out a small amount of information, not everything, and, which is what we all do. But I, I believe that Arata has done considerable experiments with different sized particles. And he and his partner, really, in this is, is Zhang, but his, probably his more important partner is uh, Fujita, who is a, a uh, who ha who's, has a laboratory across the street and has one of the world's most powerful transmission electron microscopes. And Fujita's specialty is looking at very ultra-small domains. Uh, he, he has, with his microscope, atomic resolution on a machine. So uh, uh, Fujita pushed, I think, Arata towards very small particles based on the fact that the, when, a, when a particle is made very small, as the particle size goes down, the percentage of the particle that that is in this uh, atom cluster domain that uh, Tal showed the photo of increases as the particle size goes down. And so Arata's particles are in the neighborhood of 50 nanometers, between 30 and 50 <coughs> nanometers in diameter. And until just a few years ago, that, those were impossible. That was an impossible dimension particle to obtain. And palladium black is at least an order of magnitude larger than that. And uh, so. You know, when I when I listened to uh, Case's uh, presentation in Vancouver, having been doing a lot of reading on nanoparticles, I, I had found in the reading that almost all of the literature on nanoparticles is in the field of catalysis. And in fact, in when you when catalysis scientists uh, are out to manufacture different catalytic materials, the percentage of palladium, for instance, on a carbon catalyst defines the particle size. So as the, as the percentage of palladium goes down, the particle size goes down with it. So that when Case reported in, in Vancouver that he was working with uh, palladium on carbon catalysts with palladium at about a half a percent, 
I knew from having read in the literature that that was in fact producing nanoparticles on the palladium of 50, micro, 50 nanometers or less. And that seemed to be the magic domain of Arata as well. So I, I assumed that those two experiments were very similar. The common feature was they had these, these quite extraordinary nanoparticles of the same dimension. So, uh, and, and as Mike reported in his talk, you know, we, we've been looking around for ways to measure helium in experiments, and case experiment, which is a nice gas phase experiment, makes mass setting up a mass spectroscopy, an online mass spectroscopy experiment, mm -hmm. much easier. So, you know, those are those are the three experiments that I've done, and, and helium. I've done helium analysis in both gas phase and in the solid particle, solid material phase, and in the cavitation material, we've done gas phase analysis at the U.S. Bureau of Mines gas and solid phase analysis at Rockwell International, gas phase analysis at SRI, and metal phase analysis in Arata's lab on uh, cavitation materials. And found elevated helium four in all of those, and elevated helium three and four in the studies in Arata's lab. Um, and in the nanoparticle material, the, uh, we did, of course, the, the work at SRI which had the which showed this uh, increasing plot of helium that Mike showed was the first experiment that we set up uh, just a few months after the Vancouver conference, and then most recently, what I have done following my trip, my time when I was uh, working with Arata and Zhang in their lab, I convinced them to provide me with samples of their powdered materials, both from their experiments and some of the virgin material. And I have gone to the, to, gone to the effort of having that material analyzed at, for helium at Pacific Northwest Labs in uh, Washington State, and then much more recently at McMaster's University in Canada, where we have a, a access to a superb mass spec that has uh, sensitivity to helium-3 of, of a few thousand atoms, which is quite extraordinary. And uh, so in the, in the course of doing that, this is, uh, that's a, that's a picture of the first uh, X move. Well, can't doesn't make much difference. So this is this is the first uh, two cells that were sitting at the uh, at SRI on the, at the XREL when it was still in the uh, storeroom in the back room instead of in the front lab. Once we got once we found the effects, it moved it got moved into the into the more posh surroundings. Um, well, one of the things I, I guess I I uh, thought I'd cover a few. A little bit of territory. There's a, there's another way to see helium in these experiments. And when I did the work with cavitation, I'll just run through this quickly. This is a crude picture of a cavity of a bubble that's collapsing on a surface, and it's asymmetric and it's formed a little uh, vortex in the center of it. Is that in Russian or backwards English? <laughs> Sorry, that's in the backwards English, but it doesn't make any difference to the bubble. <laughs> All right. But that's a, that's a bubble, and that's down in the neighborhood of a micron in diameter. That's a photograph taken by uh, Larry Crum at the University of Seattle, who's also the president of the American Acoustical Society. And when we collapse bubbles like that on pieces of palladium that are five centimeters on an edge of palladium foil, we load it with deuterium, with hydrogen, because the, as the bubble collapses, it has it, it, there's about a million-fold magnification of the con or condensation, essentially, a concentration of energy from the large bubble down to its smallest size. And it injects hydrogen into the lattice. If it happens to be in heavy water, it injects deuterium into the lattice. And this is a piece of foil that was in an experiment. And you can see it looks like it got burned up and melted. And it was in circulating heavy water you know, at about 60 degrees C. Um, 